Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fosco here for another edition of the show. And uh, so, I've got a couple episodes I'm going to do in here before I hit uh, Texom uh, up in Dallas. So, uh, and I haven't done it in a while. So, sorry for the for the little um, like delay, I guess, in in doing these things. But um, it's been just kind of a crazy couple months, uh, personal life and work. So, uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, but let's go ahead and get going into. Um, uh, into some wine. Now what it is, uh, I went ahead and uh, I had to buy some wine. I haven't had to buy wine in a long time. Uh, one, but I haven't really been doing any wine reviews. Um, so two, I've also, the wine reviews I have done, I've actually had a lot of wine uh, that I bought quite a few months ago. So I actually had to go out and buy some wine yesterday over at World Market. And um, only because, and it's not to sound pretentious or anything, but all the bottles I had in the house that were for review are all bottles that are premium, so $20 and over, or around $20 and over. So I was like, well, I need to get a couple bottles of value wine, so that's what I did. Um, now, I went to World Market. I had actually gone to um, a restaurant uh, uh, in San Antonio called Doe. It's a pizza place, uh, and they, they uh, make Neapolitan-type pizza and they have to be certified and all that kind of stuff. And they're one of the, well, they're the only in San Antonio and they're one of the few that are certified by the society or organization in Italy uh, or in Naples to, uh, for, for the type of oven they have to do. So they're one of the few in the United States. Uh, so dad and I went, out, went there for uh, dinner and uh, uh, had this, the pizza I usually get is called the pork lover. Really good, I like it a lot. Um, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely a different style of pizza if you're looking for that in New York or even Chicago or any other style of pizza, the American style, it's not, that's not what you're gonna get. You're gonna get um, a different type of pizza. But anyway, so we got this, uh, got a bottle of uh, Alianico, and I'll be honest, I don't remember the name of it, but I do have a picture of it. So yes, I took a picture, I tweeted that, so. Um, so of course I don't have it here handy. But, um, so I had, it was, you know, not not too uh, not too bad of a wine. It was pretty good. Um, I think it retail. I think it's they sold it on the list for forty bucks. So probably retails for around ten to fifteen. Uh, it's the Villa Matilde uh, Alianico. So um, pretty good. A little light. A little lighter than I'm used to with with Alianico, but it was it was good nonetheless. So there's a world market across the street, uh, and I hadn't been there in a while. So I thought I'd go and buy some buy some wine. Um, my intent was actually go to the HEB or the local grocery store, literally down the road from the house, because uh, I haven't probably been there in years to buy wine. And uh, but World Market was closer, and I was trying to get home. So um, let's go ahead and get into this wine. This is the 2010 Bogle uh, Old Vine Zinfandel. Uh, it retailed at World Market for like $9.99. Let's see here. Uh, 10.99. I'm sorry, 10.99. Uh, I didn't get any. I didn't get any uh, World Market Explorer discount. But you could probably find this anywhere for. Well, I don't need to rinse. You can probably find this wine um, anywhere between nine to twelve dollars. Maybe even maybe even like eight ninety. I mean, it's like seven ninety nine. But you know, at at your wine shop, so around ten dollars. And uh, so Bogle, we've had Bogle in the past on the show. Uh, it hasn't, this isn't the first time I've, I've had this label. Um, and I, I went with the Zin because, well, I haven't had a Zin in a while. And it's kind of it's kind of hard to justify that your favorite varietal is Zin if you never drink it. So um, so I thought, all right, let's, let's try it. And um, I'm first thing a little bit about Bogle. They, they've been around for a little while. Uh, 
You know, it really the only thing I'm really not happy with is I guess at one time they did have this a kind of a history on their website, but they don't really have a history per se uh, on their website. I mean, they have a thing about the family, and it talks about um, it talks about the the current president and vineyard manager, um, and he's the son of. You know the the person who founded it, who well the son and the grandson of the people who founded Bogle, but there's really nothing on the website that kind of that tells you really anything about that. Uh, luckily on Wikipedia, somebody did create something, um, and it used something from the website, their Bogle Wines fact sheet, which is no longer available on the website. So that kind of sucks. Anyway, so uh, it was formed in 1968 when Warren and Chris Bogle planted 20 acres 20 acres of grapes. Uh, the vineyard itself was formed in 1978, so I'm guessing what they mean is the winery, not the vineyard. Uh, and currently encompasses 1,200 acres, still operated by the Bogle family. Now, of course, that depends on how long, uh, how old that, that information is as far as 1,200 acres. They may have more, they may have less, who knows. Um, but uh, anyway, so we got that. Uh, their, uh, so I got their uh, Zinfandel. And on the website, I had to go into, oh, heck. I thought I had the, well, I guess I, I, guess I actually did have the, the actual, uh, here we go. Now, the, the, the one that I have here is 2010, but on their, on their label, uh, they have 2011. Oh, I thought I had the, uh, no, there's something with their, under, under the trade stuff, I'm pretty sure they had uh, information concerning the 2010. Maybe not. I guess not. They don't really have... Nope. 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 Because it's just going to be... Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, 2010. But as far as the, the basic information uh, for the 2010 versus 2011, it's probably not going to be very much different. Um, they, they sourced the vineyards out of Lodi in Amador County, and the vineyard age is between 60 and 80 years old, uh, and they, they uh, age for 12 months in two-year American oak. At least that's what the 2011 was. I'm sure 2010 was very similar. So let's check it out. Now, first of all, color-wise, you know, it's, it's really got this, you know... It, it looks cloudy, but I, I, it, it looks like it's more just that it's not necessarily cloudy, but that it's just, you know, not see-through. It's pretty opaque. But when I, when I put, try to look through my hand, I can really, I really can see, um, I really can see through it a little bit, so it's not super, super dark. It doesn't look too heavily extracted, and it doesn't, you know, it does kind of water out to the edge a little bit, but... You know, it's just a, it's just a just a straight like ruby color. All right, so it's all practice for wine tasting, wine blinds. Now on the nose, on the nose, there's 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 a lot of vanilla. There's a lot of creaminess to it. Uh, bright red fruits. I'm going to say there's also a bit of uh, pepper to it, uh, which, is, which is one of the things I really gravitate towards with Zinfandels. The spices, really, not 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 green pepper type of stuff, but like the like white pepper and black pepper, and then the spices. Uh, so what I really like about uh, Zins because they have a spiciness to it. As far as the red fruits, it, it's I'm going to say probably closer to strawberry and cherry. <coughs> Maybe a bit of raspberry, but I do feel like I'm smelling a a, 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 a a fruit pie with 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 white and black pepper on it. As far as any floral, any earthiness, I don't really get anything else like that. Got the first stations to get the shock out of the palate. Mm. 
All right, so first impression on the palate, really coats the mouth. Um, I, I can really feel the alcohol on this. Feels a bit hot. Um, acidity is, I would say, probably medium plus. Um, of course, it also could be the alcohol. It may be, I may be associating acidity with burn. So that's something I really kind of have to think about there. Um, but it really coats the mouth. Um, it's a long finish. I mean, I'm still tasting this wine. Uh, and we're talking, I'm probably 30 to 30, at least 30 seconds after the initial uh, uh, taste. Um, so I would say, well, long isn't 30 seconds, but we're, I, it, it feels like it's going to last for about a minute or two at this point. Um, the, the nose, I'm sorry, the palate really confirms the nose. Still get a lot of, of that um, creaminess. Um, I would say on, on the red fruits, really, I, I guess I'm getting more raspberry rather than any cherry or, or strawberry, but more of a raspberry flavor. Um, really get, um, I get the spices out of it. Also the tannins. That was one of the things that really was like very, very... Um, very, very, uh, uh, what you say, uh, noticeable is that the tannins were there. I, I would give this a probably a medium plus on the tannins. Getting another, you know, taste into the mouth. The wine feels like it's calmed down a little bit, probably more that I've gotten used to it. But it's still, I can still feel a little bit high in the alcohol. Uh, so probably at 14 and a half range, could be 15, but it's probably gonna be listed 14 and a half on the bottle. It means it can be anywhere between 14 and 15%. Um, the tannins aren't as, aren't as pronounced. Again, you know, it's, there's a shock to the system that's, that, that's now kind of settled down. Um, I think it's a really good wine. This is definitely something that I'd want to put with some food. It's, 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 it's a bold wine. It does hit you in the face. 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 Um, it's something that really kind of needs some pairing, but it's also got a fruit bombish part to it. Like this is, this would definitely not be like mistaken for something from the old world. Um, there's, there's a juiciness to it. You know, I feel like I, I feel like I'm I'm biting into the actual fruit, the actual raspberries. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the finish is still going, and I, my mouth is watering. So, this is probably you know I said a medium plus acidity. That is probably is the acid rather than the alcohol because alcohol is not going to make my mouth water. Okay, alcohol is going to make you you know can make you thirsty, but not like in this sense. So, um, I think it's I think it's really really good especially for something that's a, the 10 you know put the nine to twelve dollar eight to twelve dollar range um really nice uh really fruity uh and not not sweet not fruity sweet because you have to remember um a lot of people when they say i want a sweet wine well they want something that's fruit forward rather than literally sweet um the wine is dry there's no you know there's no residual sugar on it i really like this wine If I saw this on a restaurant wine list, I would definitely think about getting it, especially, it'd probably be something that would be by the glass at a restaurant. Um, so I was looking for glasses in, I've had, and now that I've had it, I would totally get it. Absolutely recommend it. Remember, I don't score anything anymore, so if you wanna call it a thumbs up, or you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I, if you wanna just listen to the comments. If I like it, I'm gonna tell you I like it. If I really like it, I'm gonna tell you I really like it. And I really like this wine. I think it's excellent. Good, good first wine to get back into the saddle as Luis Sant uh, not Santiago, as uh, Luis Sandoval uh, uh, was uh, happy to say when we checked in my Foursquare uh, check-in, he was like, I replied back, it was like, yeah, I'm about to do this, it's great to see you back in the saddle again. Anyway, uh, yes, Luis Sandoval. Uh, down here in San Antonio, working for Sweb, S-Web apps. Um, 
pretty good company, but I, I mean, I don't have, I haven't really worked with them, but uh, what I've seen of their stuff, good stuff. So anyway, check them out. If I remember, I'll put a link below to them. All right, so let's move on to the next one because I've gone rambling for quite a bit and uh, let's check it out. All right, so let's move on to wine number two. Um, now this one I've had for quite a while. Um, I'm going to, I can't remember when I bought it. And it's so far back that I can't remember when I bought it that I didn't, uh, and since I didn't mark on the bottle how much I paid for it, um, I didn't even bother trying to go through my receipts to try to find the actual receipt that I got this at Central Market. It's part of a group of wines I bought from Central Market that were quite a few that are in the over $20 range and then I had a few that were under $20. Um, so this was one of those. And this is a wine that I've seen before uh, out in the stores and you know I didn't really know too much about it. <clears throat> but it, I don't know, just my feeling was whoop, that it uh, was a pretty decent wine. Now granted I should have done this wine first because it is a Pinot Noir. Uh, this is the Rex Hill 2010 Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. This is just their regular bottling. They do have quite a few. They, they specialize in Pinot Noir at this uh, winery. They also have some Chardonnays. Uh, they say on their website that um, uh, they have a row of Muscat still, but it's like all Pinot Noir. So I'm going to just have to guess that their Chardonnays are, out, are sourced from other places in Oregon um, rather than on property. Now a little, again, of course, we like to do a little history of the wineries. Um, it was founded in 1982 by Paul Hart and Jan Jacobson, and it was built around an old fruit and nut drying facility, uh, and they opened in 1985. So they've been in business for a little while, um, say 30 something years. Uh, right? Yeah? No? Almost. Almost. Well, they were founded 30-something years ago. Uh, so now, yeah, it says, The original vineyard around the winery is now all Pinot Noir, except for one row of Muscat, left for the sweet delight of harvest visitors. Um, now, in 2007, A to Z, who we've had on the show before, or at least our wines, uh, the William Hatcher family, uh, the Francis Tannehills, and a few partners, including Greg Popovich, Go Spurs. I still haven't sent my official request to do an interview with him. And I'll be honest, the reason why I haven't been really persistent this this year is, as you can tell, I haven't even done a show. So if I don't have time to do a show, when am I going to have time to try to figure out when I'm going to interview this guy? So I'm hoping that I can do it soon. But, you know, the dude's a busy guy, and I've already been rejected a few times, and usually the rejection is um, he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk about wine necessarily. He doesn't want to come across as uh, snobbish. I think that's exactly how the email was relayed to me or, or how the email said. But you know what? I'm going to use his philosophy of tapping away. 99 times, nothing may happen, but that 100th time, I might get the interview. So it may take me 100 times to get the interview with him. Um, Anyway, so let's uh, let's go into this. We're not talking about Greg Popovich and AZ. We're talking about Rex Hill. So um, uh, they've been around, like I said, for a little while. Uh, they specialize in Pinot Noir. Now, I do want to, because I did mention they have Chardonnays. <coughs> let's just pull up one of their Chardonnays and see if it says anything about, uh, just says Willamette Valley. There's not much there. Jacob Hart, Pinot. oh, they also have a Pinot Gris, okay. Uh, a little quick detail is that most Oregon, most Oregon wines of that grape are Pinot Gris rather than Pinot Grigio because of it, just a stylistic thing. Um, oh, I was just, we're just, I just saw they have, we're not gonna go too much farther into that. Let's get into this wine itself. So, Pinot Noir, um, it's one of those love-hate relationships. You know, I've found I've had some really, really good Pinot Noirs, and I've had some really, really bad Pinot Noirs. And my first, my first uh, experience with a Pinot Noir that I can remember was Pinot Noir was not good. Even though that that winery tends to get decent reviews for their Pinot Noir, or people seem to like it, uh, I could have just it could have just been a bad year. I mean, I also have to realize this was ninety. Seven or ninety-eight or ninety-nine. I was living in Cincinnati at the time, so all I remember was like, "Ugh, this wine sucks," and I didn't really have that big of a developed of a palate. So I might think the wine is great now. All right. So anyway, okay, let's take a look at it. Um, 
you know, definitely, uh, definitely thinner. That was one of the things also about the Zen. I was surprised that it was as see-through as it was, but that's okay. Um, you know, definitely clear. Not doesn't look like it's you know doesn't look like it's cloudy or anything. Um, as far as the red, it's you know definitely a lighter red. It's not as deep ruby or dark ruby as the Zen. It's a lighter one. Uh, it really does go to really does go to a watery edge. So almost with a tint of orange to it. So it's also good to have actual white background to to look at that. Man. Remember I keep saying I, I prefer Oregon Pinot Noirs? This is exactly why. Or as far as New World or United States Pinot Noirs, Oregon tends to be the, the style I like. Can we talk just earthiness, minerality for a moment here? If, if you needed to look up what earthy or minerality mineral driven wine was in, in a wine dictionary, you should open up this bottle and, and take stick your nose in the glass because that's it, okay? I mean, all day long, I'm getting like, it's like getting like, like the, I want to say barn, I guess, but you're, you're getting, it's not, and I don't want to talk about like, it's not like you get manure or anything like that. I mean, there is a little bit, but it's like walking into an old building, like an old, old like house like on a ranch, like an old ranch house, you know, when, when you, when you're a kid and you're visiting these historical, these historical, uh, places, you know, granted it, where I grew up, it's, it, this is the smell you get. We're talking country. We're not talking old historical places in New York city. Okay. You're not, it's not the same type of old musty earthiness. Okay. We're talking wood, we're talking dirt floors, um, that type of thing. Okay. Old wood, um, you know, dust, mustiness, And then there's this, there's this fruit, I guess, dried fruit and really kind of a smokiness to it. And just, let's really get this. You know, there's, there's, there's this, there's this elusive aroma that's coming out that, I mean, just still, again, this old old historical building on, on a ranch, you know, I'm gonna, just going to say I'm like, a, like on the LBJ ranch or something like that. And you're, you know, granted, you know, say like, you know, old, an old homestead, you know, old childhood boyhood home of somebody. Okay. Where they lived in a log cabin almost, you know, it wasn't log, but you know, old wooden building. But there's this like spice to this. There's this I mean, it, it's, it feels like a combination of, of aromas. I mean, it feels like it's, it feels like it's pepper. It feels like it's mustard of all things. Okay. It's, it's, or a potpourri, you know, like maybe this is more like it's dried flowers. Okay. Moldy, dusty. I love the nose. I love the nose. There's, there's a touch of fruit, really hint of fruit. Um, it's red fruit. Um, I, I can't go more specific than that. I mean, I could, I know it's supposed to be cherry in a Pinot Noir, but you know, if I was sitting there trying to extract what, what the fruit is out of this, I, I'd have a hard time. I'd have a hard time figuring it out. Let's taste it. It's got all kinds of stuff going on with this wine. It's complex. Um, I'm not saying this is that the Zen didn't have any complexity at all. That was simple, but it really feels like there's all kinds of thing going on, but they're in concert. So it's, it's balanced. I really like the wine. First of all, I'll just get that out of the way. Secondly, I forgot to mention what the price was, even though by now you see it seen in the lower third. But for those of you that maybe aren't watching the video for some weird reason, I don't know why. Um, this wine ranges anywhere from $25 to $32 a bottle. And my memory serves, this was close to, I paid closer to 25 at uh, <clears throat> at HEB, Central Market, by the way. That's just HEB. Um, some facts about this. Um, everything is from Willamette Valley. Uh, it's French oak, ages 12, I'm sorry, 10 months and 27% new barrels. 
34% one-year-old barrels and 39% two or three-year-old barrels, which means 39% in, <clears throat> in technically neutral barrels, even though they are going to impart some kind of, some type of flavor to it. <clears throat> oh, I forgot to see what the alcohol was on this wine, on this Zin. You know, I'm not saying I got old eyes and all that, but man, that that print's really small. I'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, I like this wine. Uh, I'm still tasting it, by the way, just a little bit. It's, it's really starting to trail off, so talking a nice long finish. This wine is definitely lower acidity, low tannins. I mean, I would say medium minus, low tannin. So it's really nice, easy drinking. Um, it really accentuates all the minerality, all the, uh, not forest floor, but, you know, dirt floor uh, <clears throat> in an old woody, wooden house. Um, it really has that quality to it. There's still that that fruitiness to it. There's There's a wood part to it. I mean, it feels like you are biting into some type of mesquite or something like that. Um, it's it's very light on the fruit. I mean, I could I could probably pull out red fruit and possibly cherry to it. Um, <clears throat> not too much. There's a bit of tartness to it. Um, it's really smooth. Uh, it's really good. Um, if you like Pinot Noir, if you like earthy Pinot Noirs, if you like New World earthy Pinot Noirs, you should buy this wine. Um, it's not inexpensive or cheap. See, that's the problem. We use the word cheap. It tends to really mean quality. So if I say this is a cheap wine, or let's say another wine I'm about to do, is say oh, that's a cheap wine because it is price-wise. But it also would mean to somebody that it was it was poor quality. So, um, but this is not an expensive wine by any means. But it's definitely not inexpensive. So you know, twenty-five to thirty dollars. Uh, if you want to splurge a little bit, instead of buying a $10 Pinot Noir, uh, you want something that's going to have a little more flavor, a little more oomph to it. And you're looking for um, that that combination of New World, Old World style of Pinot Noir, because I tend to gravitate towards the older style rather than the, uh, or the older world rather than the New World. You know, I definitely would, definitely recommend it. Now, it, and there's more development to this. I mean, there's 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 more of a... There's more spices coming through and, and herbs. I mean, I almost got a hint of vanilla. Really good. It's got a nice tartness to it, too. Excellent. Well, let's uh, buy it. If you see it, buy it. All right, so we're going to move on. I don't have another wine because I'm trying to go back to the two wines and then educational segment. But what we're going to do this time for this episode is we're going to talk about that movie, that Psalm movie. So I'm going to take a break in between my recording and uh, we're going to talk about Psalm. All right, time for segment three. Um, this is weird because I've I've done movie reviews on a personal blog before, but I've never done a movie review for, for all of you. Um, so I've been knowing about this movie, Psalm, the movie, uh, for what now? I mean, over a year, I think, since they, they've been publicizing it. Uh, and it was an independent movie uh, made by, uh, you know, I should have put this up real quick. Uh, it's an independent movie, and it was made by Jason Wise, I believe his name is. Um, and he's, uh, he was a film student, and after he, after he graduated film school, he met um, one of the people that's actually profiled in here. And uh, he worked as a professional bartender uh, when he was going to film school. And uh, let's see here, from the idea of, I was trying to figure out real quick. Um, oh, pardon. Ah, uh, dang it. Anyway, uh, he met one of the one of the guys that was in the is in the production, and uh, Brian McClintock. Ah. Whew. Uh, so he uh, he was working as a server at Morton Steakhouse, and he was telling this guy Brian was telling this guy Jason what was going on. Now I guess I don't know if he was a bartender at 
I guess he wasn't a bartender at Morton's. He just said he was a bartender. He was bartending to pay rent and trying to make a film about champagne during World War One. So that's kind of interesting. And he was a friend of this guy, Brian. So, um, so it, it's a documentary. Um, it focuses around four uh, gentlemen that were um, that were studying to take this exam. Um, at least one of them had already taken the exam prior. Uh, that was Dylan Proctor, and uh, so he was uh, he was taking the stuff that he needed to take. So let's go through what the master sommelier thing is. So. For those of you that have been following me for a while, you know that I've taken the first level uh, exam from the Court of Master Sommeliers. Uh, they were founded in uh, England, uh, and there was an American chapter here that uh, was uh, founded, I think it was founded by Fred Dame. Uh, he was the first person to pass all three in one shot, at least that's what the film says. But I know that Eddie Osterland was the first American to pass, who I interviewed, first American to pass the exam. Um, and then there's a gentleman in between uh, Eddie and Fred Dame. I can't remember that guy's name off the top of my head. Um, but anyway, so this, uh, they now have four levels. It used to be three levels. It used to be a level one in advanced or, or, or inter, uh, I guess certified, advanced, and master. Now they have an introductory level, a certified, which is I'm studying for. Um, I will be taking that test um, in a month, <laughs> almost to the day in a month. Uh, we're, well, from when I'm recording this. Um, so, uh, and I'll be in Houston for that. So, uh, looking forward to doing that. Really, really looking forward to that. Anyway, um, so the Master Sommelier, and if you watch the movie, they kind of go through this, but they have to know everything from wine to spirits to beer to service, cigars. Um, that's, that's the, that's the real, uh, synopsis of, or, or, or big overview of what they have to know. And it's to, to do the master level, you've got to know it all. I mean, you've got to know the, the, the most, most littlest thing about wine and service and, and, all, and, and beer, liquor, blah, blah, blah. You've got to know all this little, really, really obscure stuff. The level I'm going for, I still have to know a lot about the general things. Um, I mean, there's specific things I need to know, <clears throat> but I need to get into the minutia of, of, of these things. But it still is the same idea. You have a theory exam, which you, um, which in the first level it's history and geography, which in general, the, the higher level exams are gonna be kind of that way. Um, but it's still gonna be, it, it's, it's still gonna be a little bit more than that. But I mean, it, it all boils down to history and geography. Maybe a little geology involved here, okay? Um, because they may be asking, you know, they'll probably ask things about soil, types of soil. So we gotta add a little geology in there, but that's, that's really what it is. Um, then you have a service aspect. Now this requires you to um, pass uh, a mock service. Now the way, they the way they demonstrated it in the introductory class, um, it looked like a pretty straightforward thing. Um, you're gonna have a couple master psalms at your table and you're gonna do a service and they can do either red wine, white wine, champagne, or you may have to decant, do, do a decanting service. Um, so it's, it's one of those four, so you don't have to do all four. Now I can tell you personally, I'm very comfortable with the first three, uh, red, white, and, and champagne, or sparkling wine, I'm sorry. Um, decanting, while it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, uh, I've decanted wines for to open them up, but not for any sediment. I don't have any wines that have sediment. I don't own any of them, nor have I had to serve anything like that. So the canting was really meant to get that sediment out of there. Uh, so you're not drinking sediment, okay? The side benefit is decanting also helps to get a whole larger surface area for the wine to interact with the oxygen. So it's, it's a good way to, to really improve that. So anyway, um, so you've got that, and then you have uh, the blind tasting, which those of you who follow me on Twitter know that I will occasionally indulge in some blind tasting. Uh, and that really is, you know, if I had been served these two wines, instead of knowing what they were, uh, they were hidden somewhere and I never even knew they were bought. All I was told was here, try this wine. I have to figure out that this was in fact, you know, the last wine, last segment, that it was in fact a 2010 Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley. Um, now, for, for the test I'm taking, all I would have had to identify was that it was a 2010 uh, Pinot Noir 
from Oregon. All right, I didn't. I wouldn't have to go anything farther than that. I wouldn't have to say that I was from from uh, Willamette. I wouldn't even have to say it was Rex Hill or anything like that. Same thing for this. All I would have had to have said was this was a California Zinfandel, uh, 2010. Also, right, 2010. Um, now, if I don't get it exactly right, it doesn't mean I fail. It just means that I didn't get it 100. percent So there's going to be some things, and, and I have to give out my comments. I have to talk about what I what I taste. So I have to justify. I can't just go, oh, this is what it is. They have to, they have to see that how I came to that conclusion. It's kind of like showing your work in class, you know, on the test, right? And when you're in school, um, you can't just go and then a miracle occurs and boom, I get the answer. So it's it's your deductive tasting, as Jeff uh, uh, Kruth uh, talks about in the movie. He's the he's the head of the Guild of Master Som or Guild of Sommeliers, um, who I'm hoping to interview at Texom. We'll see. Um, but anyway, so uh, you have that. So you have deductive tasting or blind tasting. So you have to combine all three of those. And you have to, in the master level, you have to get at least a 70 or 75% on all three, on each of the three, to pass. You can't be like, well, I nailed it 100% on one, and I got a 60 on the other, and I got a 75. And so I pa no, you got to pass all three segments. So, uh, with the certified sommelier, uh, I have to also pass all three segments. Uh, but there's a, you have to get at least a 60 on each of them. Um, so I'm pretty confident that I'm going to do well on that. I mean, I get the highest score, but I'm definitely going to pass. That's my, that's, that's my opinion. And I'm pretty sure that will bear out in August when I take the test. So I was really interested in, take, in watching this movie because I wanted to kind of see a, a somewhat behind the scenes look at studying for this test, for the master level and, and taking the test. So let's talk about the movie itself. Um, uh, just on the surface, you know, as far as a movie and how it's made, who am I to tell you whether it's well made or not? I can tell you it was my one is well made, but you know, I've watched a lot of movies. I'm not a movie critic, but I, I'll I'll tell you this much: it looks like it's well made. It looks like it's well shot, well lit. The sound's pretty good, you know. But it is an independent production, so it wasn't doesn't have million dollar budget behind it. So you know, it wasn't uh, you know. But it's a documentary. It's not meant to look like slick Hollywood green screen. It's not meant to look like that. It's a documentary, but it's well made. Okay, no, no critique there. All right, um, it, it's it it follows the four gentlemen pretty well. Now there is, I will have to say, there's a there's a part when they're when they're actually at the Four Seasons Hotel in Dallas to take the test. There is a there's a part in the movie that's kind of like, okay, it's a little slow. It's not like I'm trying. It's not like I'm a oh, whole. get let's just get moving on. But there was like a lull. And that's the only time. I mean, it was probably for about. An actual movie time, five minutes, maybe ten minutes of actual movie that I was kind of like, okay, you're, you're losing me here a little bit, but it recaptured everything. So, um, so, so as a movie, I think it's successful. I think it does what it does. It should do. Um, it does tell. I think it tells the story effectively. You really get to know the four gentlemen involved. Um, you get to meet some of the masters. They, they, they either watching them uh, coach and, and drill and quiz. The uh, not really quiz. This is all through the blind tasting um, uh, part of it. Uh, you, but you get to see the, the masters interact with some of these guys because they're mentoring them. Um, you get some interviews with some other masters, uh, and then there's also some travel. I mean, they they go to other places. They they go to Italy, Germany, and France. I believe those are the three places they went to um, to to film, and and they talk to some people over there. Um, it does focus a whole lot on the blind tasting. Now, I do have to say that I get probably why they do that. Studying for a test is probably pretty freaking boring. Who, I mean, they, they do talk about it and they show them studying. They show them to talk about the note cards and doing Skype talk, you know, they're Skyping with each other, um, note cards and, and what they have to do for the studying. And they, they you, you see, you see shots of the books that these guys are reading. So, I mean, what else are you going to show? I mean, I mean, it's pretty boring to show how a camera on somebody studying, reading a book. So, um, the the most the most exciting part is watching these guys blind taste. Um, it's exciting to the general public because they're like they're it, it, they start rattling off all these things. You're just like what? And the best part is when these guys don't agree on the wine. So that one guy says it must be this, and other guys must be this, and they don't agree. And then you reveal one of them is right. Okay, um, and there's even parts in the movie where you see that 
you know, it's just nobody knows. When they take the test, it's revealed that you don't actually know what they drank, uh, which I thought kind of sucks. I, I mean, I really would have thought that after the exam was over, you would have at least been told, hey, wine one was this, wine two was this. But I guess they, I don't know why they do, don't tell you. I, I may try to bring that up when I'm at the tech song, be kind of like, why don't you know? I mean, I know in the introductory level, you're never told your score. All you're told is you can pass or you failed. And I can tell you as far as the theory test, you know which questions you missed, okay? You know which questions you got right. So you don't really, I don't really need to see the score. I just, I know what I'm gonna miss and what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna get right. So as soon as I get out of the test, I, I opened up the Wine Lover's Companion, which is incredible. And it's also on Kindle, so it means I can pull it up on my phone or pull it up on my iPad. Um, <clears throat> so I can look up some reference stuff to see if I was right or wrong. So that's what I did with the first two tests I took, the introductory test and then the certified specialist wine from the Society of Wine Educators. Um, so I knew pretty well whether I passed or failed. Um, but it would be kind of nice to know what, I, what on the wines if you were right or wrong. But I guess at that level, you know, you do so much blind tasting, you know how well you taste in general. So it's not like, I guess, it's critical to know. Uh, and then the service part. Now, I do have to say, this is the one part of the movie that I really wish they, they got into a little more. They showed one mock service with Dylan Proctor uh, and Fred Dane and Drew Hendricks. So they don't really say who the other guy was. He's Drew Hendricks. He's out of Houston. Awesome guy, by the way. Um, but um, I like to interview him sometime, too. So, Drew, if you watch this, we got to do an interview. Hey, maybe when I'm in Houston taking my test, we can interview him. I'm going to have all my stuff with me. Anyway, um, so, and, and all they really showed was Dylan just trying to make the bottle of wine cold, you know? And I'm like, okay, and, and, and they're having fun with it, and they're being very difficult guests, you know, and they're, they're having a lot of fun with that part, but it's kind of like, I, I kind of wish for the average person, it would be kind of cool to see you know, what, what they're going through rather than just that. But again, I guess how, how interesting can you make that? You know, the, the, the most spectacular thing of anyone, because I've, now that I've done it in front of other people and I've been successful with blind tasting, it really, they really are amazed that you can figure out what a wine is. You know, to me, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, I guess it's pretty amazing. But at the same time, if you do it a lot and you know what you're supposed to get out of a wine, you can at least narrow it down. But like I said, you know, when you make a mistake, when you're like wrong, I mean, I, I've been dead wrong, I sit there and start thinking, well, how did I go down that path? And that was one of the cool things about the movie. Uh, Jeff was there, the four guys were doing a blind tasting. Jeff Kruth was there guiding them. And there's a point where he says, you, you know, you're going, you, you got two roads, you're going down the road and you get forks off into two roads, okay? You know, on one road, you've got, uh, what did he say? You have fruit and something else. And the other road, you've got, um, tobacco and earth and cure and dried meat okay meatiness on the other side you got like a, a more fruit fruitiness <clears throat> no i'm sorry no no okay because no, i don't remember what wine is talking about on the one side you've got you've got <clears throat> bell pepper and um what was the other thing that you talked about uh not fruitiness but there was there was a there was a there was a um, i guess a woodiness part of it on the other side you've got um smoked meat okay and i guess earth, whatever some of the earthiness with that so one's going to take you to cap franc and one's going to take you to uh syrah uh and one's going to take you to chinon and one's going to take you to northern rhone so and, and the thing is i know that watching the movie that that conversation happened before ian cobble was calling the wine now quite a few not quite a few minutes later but yeah a few minutes later Cobble was naming the wine, and he was correct. Uh, he took it to being a Syrah, and it was what, it, what they were talking about: was these markers. You know, you might, you might, a lot of wines will have similar things, but then there'll be that one thing that will distinguish it from something else, and it might distinguish it. It might be the same varietal, but it'll distinguish it from being New World, Old World, but not even just that. Your Old World, well, is it going to be this part or this part or this part? So. You know this this area of France or this area of Italy or whatever, um, or if you're New World, is it going to make it Sonoma or Napa, or is it going to make it Oregon, or is it going to you know, as far as when you get into California and Oregon, or if you're going to Australia, what part of Australia? So these are the things that they look for, and the only way you know is by tasting. You have to taste a lot.
And I think that's probably why they really focused, it felt like they focused on the, on the tasting. Um, it is definitely an industry movie. Um, it's kind of those movies where, okay, so for instance, the movie Waiting, it's really an industry movie, but it appealed to, or, or it was funny for a lot of people who never worked in a restaurant. The problem is a movie like that puts a, puts a bad face in front uh, as far as restaurants. It makes it look like the, your kitchen staff and your waiters are doing everything you can to screw up your food, uh, especially if you send it back. Well, I, of all the restaurants I've worked in, I've never had that happen. I've never had somebody intentionally sit there and do, especially, especially the gross stuff in the movie, okay? Um, but I've never had anyone intentionally do something to someone's food. Uh, and if they ever did, I wouldn't work for that place. And we're not the same thing with SOM, but SOM really is, does appeal to the people like me. They're either, in, in, either doing the coursework or you know, in, in the process of, of taking these exams or someone who's looking to take the exams. For your average person, it's, it's, a, it's a nice glimpse into what they do. You know, the, one of the taglines is the hardest test you've never heard of. You know, and I do believe, I do believe it is. Um, wow, I've really droned on a lot about this movie. Let's just wrap it up. I, I, they, one, first of all, they sent me the they sent me the trailer to download so I could use clips of it. But I'll be honest, the trailer itself, it, there's nothing clippable in it. it. It's a bunch of clips anyway. So uh, if, if you want, I'll put a link to the trailers you can find. Okay, um, I'm not going to add it to my my move, my video file because it's not almost three more minutes. So I'm not going to add it to mine. Uh, watch the trailer. I'll put a link, like I said, to where the, you can find the trailers. Um, it gives you a general overview. overview. Um, they weren't, they weren't going to give me permission to clip any parts of the movie. Uh, I really wish I could have because it had been kind of cool to talk about these, these parts of the movie and then show the clip. The problem is that the, the uh, uh, trailer doesn't have any of the clips I would want to talk about anyway. Or there's so, such a small thing you can't, you can't tell what's happening. So, But, you know, hey, that's... I'm not, again, I'm not some official movie critic, so I'm not going to get anything other than just like, oh, cool, we hope you review it, and, uh, well, here's the trailer. Without me breaking the DRM and going to jail for it, so I'm not going to do that. Sorry, guys. Um, but see the movie. If, if you've been on the fence about seeing it, do it. You can get it off of iTunes. I bought it the day it was available. You can now rent it off of iTunes. Uh, if it's playing in the theater near you, do it. If you're going to TechSom and you haven't signed up for uh, a different seminar like I did, whoops, sorry, sorry microphone, uh, like I did, then um, go see the movie. It's during one of the regular seminars and it, it wasn't listed. And I'll be honest, since I've already seen the movie, I probably wouldn't go watch the movie again at TechSom. I would rather go listen, or I'd rather go to one of the, the seminars. And this is not, a, this is not a, a, a dig at the movie, it's just that's what I would do. Um, if I hadn't seen the movie, then I would probably at least seriously think about seeing it at Tech Psalm because it'd be kind of cool to see it with a bunch of other Psalms. But since I've already seen it now twice, um, I don't think I really need to watch it again with a bunch of Psalms. I'd rather you know, go to a, a seminar about something else, or actually two seminars about something else. Uh, but yeah, see the movie. Uh, that's gonna wrap it up. Uh, another long video. Hopefully the next episode won't be that long, um, but we'll see. Uh, real quick. Uh, I did get a new wine co wine tool. I'll again link the website. Uh, so go down, go down to the website, click the link to this, go to the Amazon store. Bought it specifically for the um, uh, test, the certified test. It's a nice heavier feel than the one I have. The other one I have, I had the same one at work, and the the worm busted opening a bottle of wine. So I do not want to bring that <laughs> that wine opener <laughs> to my test. Uh, and have it break in front of me. I mean, it'd be great to see how I recover from it, but I don't. But I, I don't think rushing to the back of the house to get a to get a pair of pliers to to uh, finish opening the bottle would would do good. Anyway, uh, that's going to do it for now. Uh, as always, thank you for stopping by. Click the links above to friend me up. Click the link over here to donate some money so I can pay for some more wine. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Mm -hmm.